two of us in one video? Yeah, doing separate videos for red, blue, and yellow last time was fun, but the, the views don't lie. Oh, right. People thought they were all the same thing, eh? Yeah, we recorded the skit three times with, like, slight differences, and nobody noticed. Well, I'm here now. Any, any way I can help? We're already doing more than that guy eating glue in the corner. Don't worry. It's sour cream. Let me tell you a story all about when I got a Game Boy when I was just short of 10. I wanted red or blue, but when my folks at the store, they came back with Babe and Friends and Disney's Dinosaur. And then I found Mario Land in the playground or something, and that was good. There you go, there's your crayon lore quota. And then a year later, I got Pokemon Gold version for Christmas, and I was glued to the thing. Like, I messed around in my cousin's yellow version a bit, and I played a lot of stadium at friends' places, but this was the first Pokemon game that was mine. And why am I telling you all this? Because as impartial as I'd like to be, I won't be. And here's your warning. Three years after the booming success of Pokemon Red and Green, after padding out their lineup with blue and yellow versions, Game Freak blessed us with a sequel. Zzz. Pokemon Gold and Silver for the Game Boy Color. Even though it's technically a, a Game Boy cart. And it was meant to be their last fun fact. But like the kid in class who could kick themselves in the head, people liked it, so they kept doing it. The kid was me. <laughs> Gold and Silver take place three years after the plot of Red and Blue. And Green and Yellow. After Red beat and drove Giovanni into dismantling Team Rocket and going into hiding, we find remnants of Team Rocket scattered around this new region, Johto, trying to pick up the pieces and bring their old boss out of hiding. Joke's on them. The new region of Johto is just west of Kanto from the first game and is based on Japan's Kansai and Tokai regions, giving the place a real ancient Japanese feel with the buildings and music. They got like pagodas and shit, it's nice. They've added 100 new monsters to the original roster of 151, even adding new evolutions and pre-evolutions to some of the OG cast. As well as genders, breeding, baby Pokemon, two new types, shinies, Pokeris, hold items, new evolution methods, a real-time clock with night and day cycles, and weekly events, berries, wandering legendaries, and the special stat being split into special tech, and special defense stats. Saying that they changed up the formula is telling the truth. With breeding, you can now obtain younger evolutions of Pokemon you already own, as well as baby Pokemon that are mostly unobtainable by other means. And you can also breed new moves onto a Pokemon that can't normally learn it, like giving Fampy Water Gun. I'll never understand why they took that from you. The two new types are Dark and Steel, giving us a new grand total of too many. Psychic types wreaked friggin' havoc in red, blue, yellow, and instead of beefing up the types they were already weak to, they added another. What did Bug get in this generation? Megahorn? Dark is immune to Psychic and overall just ruins their night, purely for balancing. Steel is <laughs> rad as fuck, resistant to everything that matters and even immune to poison as if they needed to be taken down a notch. Steel types also generally are more durable. If you don't have a fire or fighting type, these suck to go up against. Hold items change friggin' everything. Like, I could use my turn to heal my Pokemon, but he ain't paying rent, let him do it itself. Pokemon can now hold items that activate on their own or passively do something from healing a status ailment or slightly boosting certain moves. Some Pokemon need to be holding specific stuff to evolve even. Also, they added mail. The last big change they did was the real-time clock. Certain Pokemon only show up at certain times of day, and special events can trigger if it's the right day of the week. Gives you a reason to play at different times, it's realistic and immersive, I, I love it. But beyond all that, it's the same overall RPG formula with 8 badges, an Elite 4 to face, version exclusives to force you into having friends, a rival that's somehow even more of an ass than the last one, and a Pokedex to 100% the game. But there are even more differences in Crystal version released a year later. Hey, you want to talk about your... He's in the bathroom. That was a lot of sour cream. Crystal is mostly the same as Gold and Silver, sans a slightly altered plot to focus on Suicune, being able to play a girl for the first time ever, moving sprites, and a battle tower. But the coolest thing about these games, and the first and usually only argument people have for defending these games, after conquering the Johto region, you get to then traverse the entirety of the Kanto region from the first game. And some things have changed over the last three years. So I did lie when I said there was eight badges. There's actually the full 16. Remember when I said this was going to be their last entry? And a bang it was. And after completing both regions, what are we missing? 
Who were we missing? Someone who was very important in the story of the first game. No, no, Venomoth is right there. Red. The f***ing pro tag from the previous title. What game does that? Your last challenge is a well-balanced team of level 80s atop a freaking mountain. And it's f***ing magical. Probably the best fight in the series still. Now this is the part where I tear the game down. Zenter? The Zenter? From Spamsterdam? Why might you be calling me in my 1998 LCD electronic toy? And how? I heard you were talking down the best Pokemon games. I didn't say that. Sure thinking it pretty loudly though. Listen, alright? It had a very immersive day-night system. It, they introduced shinies, a radio, they even threw in Kanto because Glad to have a second opinion though. Phone calls suck. Like, I understand that it's a way to do rematches, but there's only so many times I want to travel back to the jungle gym with the box deity and end a child's life. They added two new types, but they kept them entirely absent from the bulk of the game. If you don't want an Umbreon, you're waiting until the literal last location of the game to get a Sneasel or Tyranitar. And I'm all for having rarer Pokémon be harder to find, but you can't advertise the cashews in your trail mix then only include one and it's hidden under the lining of the cap. The only Steel type that isn't a trait evolution that can learn a Steel attack at all is Skarmory. It's not just the new types either, maybe 20 something of the new 100 Pokemon get used in major fights in the main game. Why doesn't Faulkner have a Hoot Hoot? We've got Ariados and Ledian and Bugsy has Cocoons. Where's Morty's Mischievous? There are literally two Ghost Pokemon, and the whole place just has Ghastly Evos. And we got some cool new fighting types in Hitmontop and Heracross, and Chuck has a Polyrath. There is an easy explanation for that, but you're not going to want to hear it. The Pokemon suck. Don't get me wrong, I love them. They're quirky and weird, and that one? Hello. How many kidneys do you want? But they're mechanically a joke. Everyone's slow. It feels like they had separate teams designing stat blocks and move pools, and they just weren't allowed to talk. They let half-baked, non-evolving Pokémon run rampant, and then gave Chansey an evolution? I can count the amount of good new Pokémon on one hand. But don't be afraid of using whatever. They remedied this issue by having the game be easy as piss. The Elite Four are in their 40s. The entirety of Kanto rarely reaches out of the level 30 range. Victory Road is devoid of people, and then Red suddenly has level 80s. They were trying to give you the option to play it semi-open world, so they couldn't balance it without it being a joke. They gave us Kanto, and it's sick to get two whole regions, 16 badges, but there's nothing in it. They just barely fit it onto the cart. They couldn't bring all the people too. Or Viridian Forest. <laughs> it was cool to see how Kanto had changed over the last three years. Blue is the Viridian Gym Leader, Pokemon Tower is now a Radio Tower, Cinnabar got Pompeyed, but then the construction site in Vermilion just hasn't been touched. I guess Snorlax likes sleeping there specifically. I know they basically just copy and pasted the place, it's fine, just feels like a really cool idea on paper that turns into an area you vaguely remember that you just walk through. Hey, you remember Mr. Fuji, who had a key part in the last game? Well there he is, with his one line of dialogue. Isn't that cool? <laughs> Team Rocket does nothing, they're tacked on as a thing from the first game, and it never amounts to anything important. Giamani doesn't even make an appearance. They wanted him to notice them, senpai, and he's like, lol, see it in the remake. Unknown have so much potential, and they're designated to a couple puzzles and zero plot relevance. It feels like they were trying to make Pokemon 1.5. It relies so much on what Red and Blue set up, and doesn't really stand on its own story-wise. But I still love it though. It commits to a theme, it's one of the prettier Game Boy games. The atmosphere is fantastic. They added so many new mechanics that are absolute staples to this day, it's built off the groundwork that Red Blue Yellow set up, and it improves upon everything. Not the best, but I damn well thought it was till very recently. So what you're saying is that despite its clear, glaring, objective faults, it's still your favorite game because you played it when you were eight? You know what? How about you go f*** yourself?
Hey, I just wanted to thank you guys for a thousand subs. That's uh, a long time coming. <laughs> Uh, it's clear that the algorithm, like, really hates me, but there's at least a thousand of you that don't. Thanks.